Hello everyone, I'm still in Venice and in this video I'm really excited to bring you all along to see the Venice Biennale and if you haven't seen my other Venice video where I visit Doge's palace as well as some of the other palazzos, I encourage you to watch that. I will leave it linked above and below. And also if you haven't subscribed yet, I post videos about the contemporary art world. So if you're into that, you can click the subscription button and that notification bell and it will let you know every time I upload a new video. So as I mentioned, today we are going to see the Venice Biennale, which is one of the largest and most important contemporary visual art exhibitions in the world. It's kind of like the Olympics for the art world, and it's been on every two years since 1895. Of course, there have been a few exceptions like wars and, and this recent pandemic, but for the most part, it does rotate on a two-year schedule. But before we begin making our way to the Venice Biennale, we are going to have breakfast at Café Florian, which is an iconic establishment from the 1700s. So for this trip, we stayed a little closer to the Rialto Bridge, so it's going to be about a 30 to 40 minute walk to where the Biennale takes place. But it's not too bad, most of it's by the water, which is beautiful. So while we walk, I'm going to give you a little bit of a backstory about the Biennale. The exhibition spans over 7,000 square meters, and it has artists from over 75 countries that have works in the collective exhibition spaces as well as the national pavilions. In fact, there's so much to see. I highly recommend seeing it over the course of at least two to three days, otherwise it can be a little bit overwhelming. And the Biennale lives in two main spaces. So there's the traditional site, which is at the Giardini, and this is what we're gonna see in this video. And then there's also gonna be a part two where we see the art in the Arsenale. In the Giardini, there's a large exhibition hall which is called the Central Pavilion. And it has an exhibit curated by the Biennale's director. And then there are 29 national pavilions. And these are permanent spaces dedicated to a specific country where they exhibit an artist of their choosing. Also, disclaimer, this video is going to be very similar to how I film art fairs. I'm just showing a highlight of what I saw. There was so much more than what I'm going to show, and I'll include the artist names and I will link info about each of them and their works below in the description box if you want to read about them in greater detail. So each year, the Biennale has a different theme, and this year for the 59th edition, the theme is The Milk of Dreams, which is inspired by a book of the same title by Leonora Carrington, and quote, in which the surrealist artist describes a magical world where life is consistently re-envisioned through the prism of the imagination. It's a world where everyone can change, be transformed, become something or someone else, a world set free, brimming with possibilities. While that's beautiful, it's also pretty generic. So the curator of the Central Pavilion, which is where we are now, Cecilia Alemani, has defined three themes of focus for the Biennale inspired by this book. So the first is the representation of bodies and their metamorphosis. The second is the relationship between individuals and technologies. And the third is the connection between bodies and the earth. So as you're viewing all these works, see if you can identify any of these themes in them. In total, The Milk of Dreams features over 200 artists from 58 countries. And what's really cool is more than 180 of these artists have never been in the Biennale before. Thank you. 
We're now going to check out some of the national pavilions. And as a reminder, in this part of the Biennale, there are 29 countries that have permanent spaces, the earliest actually being the Belgian pavilion, which was constructed in 1907. We're going to start with the pavilion of the United States of America, which features works from Simone Lee. And she actually received the Golden Lion Award for Best Participant for these works, which is the highest honor of the fair. And the exhibition is titled Sovereignty and speaks to the idea of, quote, not being subject to another's authority, another's desire, or another's gaze, but rather to be the author of one's own history. So in this exhibit, Lee uses her sculptures to, quote, imaginatively fill the gaps in the historical record. So for example, the work that we saw when we first came in, titled The Last Garment, is loosely inspired by a, quote, degrading 19th century Jamaican souvenir postcard genre that features black laundresses. So Lee reimagined the woman, reinstating her dignity by casting her in bronze and positioning her in an elegant black wading pool. This is the Japan Pavilion, and this year it features a work by Dumb Type. Dumb Type is an art collective made up of nine members, and they're known for installations and video works. So this installation consists of spinning mirrors that reflect this projected text from a geography textbook from the 1950s that poses simple yet universal questions like, what is the earth? What governs an empire? And this is meant to represent the, quote, massive transformation in the ways in which people communicate and the ways in which we perceive the world, mostly thanks to social media and the global pandemic. This is the Republic of Korea Pavilion, which features works by the artist Yoonjo Kim, and the exhibit is titled Jir, and it features a quote, body of entanglements, which in a second, you'll understand exactly what I'm talking about. Throughout the exhibit, you see a series of reactions happening. There's movement, almost chaos at times, and it's all meant to represent the constant motion of life and how our bodies, our senses react to things like materials, machines, non-humans, but also each other.
This is the Switzerland Pavilion, and it features works from Latifa Ekshas, and it immediately gives you a feeling of being in some sort of post-apocalyptic world. It's very Blade Runner-esque. And this is all intentional. The artist is taking us on a journey where we're really meant to explore the perception of time. This year in the German pavilion, Maria Eichhorn has focused on the pavilion's history and its transformation. So in 1909, it was the Bavarian pavilion, and then it became the German pavilion in 1912. In 1938, it was redesigned by the Nazi regime to fit their cultural ideology, and it still re resembles that fascist architecture to this day. So what you're looking at here is where Eichhorn has uncovered the original building of 1909, exposing that connection between past and present. This is the Brazilian Pavilion, which features works by Jonatas de Andrade, and they're inspired by popular culture, particularly popular sayings. So take the ears that I just walked through, for instance, they're positioned on actually the entrance and the exit of the pavilion. They allude to the phrase, in one ear and out the other. And as you can see, there's an eye, there's various body parts all over the exhibit. So that combined with the sayings captures this moment in history that we're all living in. The France Pavilion features works from Neb Sedira, 
And she's the first artist of Algerian descent to represent the country. And this is important because the whole exhibit is inspired by her heritage, specifically the Algerian independence movement of the 1960s. This was when Algeria fought and won their independence from France. So Sidira was specifically inspired by how aspects of Algerian culture have been represented in film during this time. So what we see here is her transformation of the pavilion into a variety of film sets. And these are based on the films that were made during this time, such as The Battle of Algiers, Le Mal Libres, and The Stranger. This is the Israel Pavilion, which features works from Yit Azulai, and the exhibit is titled The Queendom, and it asks the question, how sovereign can art be? So in Azulai's Queendom, she imagines this idealized world, a place where, quote, non-patriarchal, trans-regional, interconnected Middle East, where identities are fluid, ambivalences are welcomed, and complexities are appreciated. So to make this world feel more real and authentic, she's incorporated images of these medieval metal vessels of Islamic art, and she's digitally arranged them to make this beautiful inkjet print. This is the final national pavilion that we're gonna to see today. This is the Poland Pavilion, and these are works by Magorzata Mirgadas. And the exhibit is titled Re-Enchanting the World, and it's inspired by the Renaissance Palazzo Schifanoia, which is a palazzo in Italy that features these beautiful frescoes from floor to ceiling. So Mirgatas has recreated that feeling, but instead of frescoes, she's lined the walls with these textile murals that depict various aspects of Roma culture. In fact, many of the materials that you see here come from the wardrobes of the people depicted.
I hope you all enjoyed these highlights from the Venice Biennale. In part two, I will take you to my personal favorite part of the Biennale, the Arsenale, as well as some more of the National Pavilion. So be sure to subscribe so you don't miss that video and let me know which artist or pavilion was your favorite.